So before we get to that, let's talk about your background and training so they understand why uh, you and not me are, are, are on the stand. Sure. Um, so uh, where did you go to school? I did my bachelor's of science and engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. I majored in mechanical engineering and applied mechanics. And then after undergrad, I moved west and I got my master's and my PhD at UC Berkeley in the mechanical engineering department. And I had two disciplines that I specialized in. One was called dynamic systems. That's how objects move in space when forces are applied to them. And the other is biomechanical engineering. And that is the application of physics and engineering to the human body, in particular, looking at how people get injured and how to prevent injuries. And did you do a PhD thesis? I did. And can you explain what you worked on? Sure. Um, I, I was uh, the last in a line of what we called skiologists. Um, I studied the biomechanics of alpine skiing. I uh, created load cells, so those are uh, devices that measure the forces, and I put them in between the skis and the bindings. And uh, I had different instrumentation on skiers, and it was the first time, or at least that I'm aware of, that we were, uh, anyone in the scientific community, was able to measure the forces and the body motions of skiers from the top of the mountain all the way down to the bottom. And I did this with beginners, people who had only skied two or three days in their whole life, uh, all the way up to professional racers. And so uh, that's what I got my PhD in. And this is actually measurements on the slope as people are skiing. That's right, exactly. Yeah, I'm measuring the forces applied to the person and their body motions as they're skiing. Well, and falling, we did have falls as well. Right, and so you, this is not just calculations in some ivory tower, but you're actually out in the field looking at Hands-on work, which is quite difficult when you have electronics and snow and water. It, it was challenging for sure. And do you also t do any teaching? Uh, I did teach. Um, after I graduated with my PhD, I did a, a small postdoc in the biology department at Berkeley. And then after that, uh, while I was working for a company, I taught at the University of Southern California. I was in the physical therapy department uh, on the medical campus, and I taught intro to biomechanics. And I also did research there at USC. And then um, I moved, uh, I now live in Seattle, and I'm at the University of Washington. I have an affiliate professorship there. I'm an associate, affiliate, associate professor at the University of Washington, and I occasionally lecture, but mostly advise grad students. What about uh, professional licenses? Do you have any of those? I'm a registered professional mechanical engineer in California, Washington, and Alaska. And then in terms of professional societies, these groups of people that uh, get together to research and work on a certain field, are you connected to any such uh, organizations? I am. And what are those? I am chair of a group called ASTM F27. If you've ever gone to a ski shop and uh, purchased ski equipment or rented uh, ski equipment and they set your bindings, what some people call DIN settings, um, that's based on the standards from ASTM and I'm uh, the chairman of that group. We also do other snow sports equipment. Um, I represent the US for snow sports equipment safety uh, at the International Standards Organization, so the ISO. So if uh, you go over to Europe, you'll have the same uh, release and retention settings for your skis. Your, your bindings won't pull off your skis. They use the same standards that we've developed here in the US. Um, I'm also president of a group called the International Society for Snow Sport Safety. And that's um, more academic than the other two organizations I was mentioning. Uh, we call it IFSS. IFSS is the premier organization worldwide to present and publish your snow sport safety research. Um, and we have members from uh, all over the world, Switzerland, Korea, Norway, obviously the US, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a great group. And it's really the group that helped develop uh, ski binding standards. So you do some research uh, on um, 
the safety of snow sports like skiing, correct? That is my main focus of my research ever since grad school, and I've continued to do that now. And then you, you also evaluate cases in a, a litigation context, is that right? I do. About 15%, 20% of my work is uh, forensic work. The rest is research and development. So most of the time, uh, are you doing research to, to try and uh, improve the safety of skiers on the hill? Yes, uh, and I should say it's not just snow sports. I work in other recreational sports areas, water sports, mountain biking, uh, other areas too, but snow sports is my, my favorite, my passion. So let's explain to the jury what bio biomechanical engineering is, just because sure. we could use a refresher. Sure, biomechanical engineering is the application of physics and mechanical engineering to the human body. But in a forensic sense, um, it's what links the event to the injury. So if you have some type of event and there's forces and motions in the event, in the accident, the forces are applied to a person, there's internal forces on the, like in their body at the joints or something like that, the amount of force and the amount of motion it takes to create damage to the body, that is biomechanical engineering. And how's that different than medicine? They're both dealing with the human body, but what's the difference? <clears throat> sure, the medical field tends to uh, take the injured person, figure out what's wrong with them, so diagnosis, and then try to get them better, so treatment uh, with an eventual outcome. So um, most medical training is after the injury, as opposed to what forces and motions create the injury. We like to think of ourselves on different sides of the injury. Thank you. Can biomechanical engineers determine the forces required to produce fractures of bones in the body? Yes, um, there's a lot of research on that, and that's one of the main areas for biomechanical engineering. So is there scientific literature that describes the forces needed for, say, rib fractures? There is, yes. yes. And you're familiar with that literature? I am, yes. And uh, let's, let's maybe ask a specific question about that literature given your knowledge of it, does a 70-year-old man need to fall on his side uh, with his elbow between him and the ground to cause rib fractures? No, so there have been a number of scientific studies, mostly done by biomechanical engineers, but there's other scientists who have looked at this as well. And what they do is they take cadavers or portions of cadavers and they apply forces to them. Um, sometimes they'll swing a pendulum into the side of a cadaver or into the front, um, or they'll have a plate, a very heavy weighted plate, uh, contact the person, arm down, arm up at 45 degrees, um, or they'll drop the cadaver in different configurations, and then they'll see what injuries are produced. And so um, when they've done this, in particular for uh, chest impacts, what we find is you can get lateral rib fractures, according to the biomechanical engineering literature, you can get lateral rib fractures with a, an impact to the side with your arm down or with your arm up, but you can also get lateral rib fractures from compression, so front to back compression of the chest. So if I press my chest in like this, what happens is the ribs actually bend out on the side and that can create fractures on the side, and that's quite common as well. So rib fractures are not just from side contact, it can be from front to back compression as well. So um, let's get to um, what you did in this case. So what did I ask you to do in this case? Uh, basically you asked me to evaluate Dr. Baim's biomechanical engineering analysis to see if it was accurate and correct. And what material did you review? I think you already mentioned you read his transcript and you watched his trial testimony, is that I right? Did. I did, yes. And maybe for the jury, in case they need a reminder, he had that green screen in the back of him. Right, just the talking head. He's exactly. speaking from Florida, I think. That's right. All right. And so let's uh, just start with his analysis. Do you agree with it? I do not. I do and, not agree with his analysis. And maybe uh, before we explain why, just give us a sense of what you, what you understand his method and analysis to be. 
Sure. Um, as I've gone through what he testified to in his deposition, in the trial, looking at his calculations and what he's done, to me, there's two parts to his analysis. The first is calculations to show that Miss Paltrow had to land on Mr. Sanderson in order to get the rib fractures that he got. And then there was a second part that basically said, um, because Miss Paltrow had to land on Miss Mr. Sanderson, that could only happen with Miss Paltrow hitting him from behind. It couldn't happen any other way. It was impossible. So that's my understanding of the, the kind of the two parts, the main parts. Thank you. We'll go in those go over those in more detail. As you looked at his analysis, you read everything that he read, correct? I did. And did you read even more than that? Uh, I had additional depositions, that's correct. Of the various people that were at the scene of the accident? That's right. Um, so let's get one thing out of the way. D do you agree with Dr. Bain that Mr. Sanderson's rib fractures did not occur during the initial skier-to-skier -skier contact? Yes, I, I think that that's correct. There's no disagreement at this point, at least from the testimony <coughs> I've heard. Um, the skier skier portion where they first contact, no matter which version we have, um, did not create the rib fractures. I don't think anyone thinks that at this point. So that's good. We, we agree. And um, in terms of just a, a quick overview before we go into uh, his calculations, which you can explain to the jury, do you believe that Ms. Paltrow's account and, and I should say, are you familiar with her account? I am. And you heard her trial testimony? I did. And read her deposition? And yes. do, you, do you believe her account of the collision uh, is consistent with what you know about biomechanical engineering? Object. Goes beyond the scope of this expert witness. They call for the evaluator. Go with your testimony. Would, would you please approach the bench? <clears throat> Okay, so let's go back to that question. I was asking you, in your opinion, is Ms. Paltrow's account consistent with what you know about biomechanical engineering? Yes, it is. And maybe another way to put that um, is, is it consistent with the laws of physics? It's the same question, yes. Yeah, and exactly. Dr. Baim, the jury heard, talked a lot about Newton's laws and the laws of physics, applying those to the evidence in this case. And again, in your analysis, as you apply them, Ms. Paltrow's um, uh, account is consistent with those. Objection lies foundation. Overruled? That's correct. Her, Ms. Paltrow's version, her, her scenario, is consistent with the laws of physics and what we know about biomechanics. And then th the account that Dr. Baim gave and that is uh, based on Mr. Ramon's account um, is that consistent with the laws of physics? I do not believe it is, and I can explain as we get into it. Yes, okay, great, we'll, we'll explain that. Let's 
let's um, go to Dr. Bame's calculations so you can explain to the jury um, your analysis of those. I'm, we, can, we have an easel, and as I understand it, you, you would like to kind of draw so that you can show them what the equations mean. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Okay, so I'll grab the easel and then that board. see it so I'm fine with that okay and, and I think uh, I'll if it's Jeremy. okay with the judge you you can get off the stand and, yes. yep. sure. and there's your marker okay so I'm gonna pull up something that Dr. Bain pulled up uh, in his deposition. Do you remember seeing these documents? And for the record and for counsel, these are um, the notes in Exhibit 3 of Dr. Bain's deposition. Oh, th thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I missed the question there. Yeah, no, you're fine. So I'm just pointing but you to. Before you, uh, these are not admitted exhibits, though. Yeah, I'm not asking them to be admitted. They were just shown in Dr. Bain's deposition, so we're showing them here as well. Okay, but not in his trial testimony. He's responding to these. You said deposition. He also showed it in his trial testimony. So oh, direct. trial deposition. Yeah. Yep. I was going to say direct things to the judge, but I, I recall I recall this being flashed uh, during wrong. his deposition or during his trial testimony. Okay, thank you, Dr. Schur. So you recognize this page? I, I do. And I was just describing it. This was shown in Dr. Bame's trial testimony, correct? That's correct. And he explained that these are his calculations? That's right. Okay, and there's another page as well. I think it's the one just before it, correct? That's correct. This is where he starts the calculations for the ribs. We're concentrating on the ribs here because that's what he says determines how the, the accident happened. He said the head injury doesn't matter for that, it's only the ribs. Okay, great. So since I have very little idea what's going on there and you do, maybe explain to the jury what's going on. Sure, can we go to the page before this? Sure. And maybe if you, it's just a little oh. bit hard to hear. Sorry, is that better? Yeah, that's okay. a little better, yeah, thanks. Um, so he's using some um, basic equations for what we call the center of mass to figure out what happens when someone falls to the ground. Uh, center of mass is if you were to balance someone on, on your finger, the point that you'd hold them at so that they stay balanced. Um, it's usually a little bit um, below your belly button, kind of midline, front to back, midline, left to right. Um, and so if you took the person's, all the person's weight, all the person's mass and put it into one point, that would be the point that you're interested in. So that's what Dr. Bame is doing in these calculations is he's using that point for Mr. Sanderson, and this first part here, where he has this, um, that's an equation, x is position, so he's saying there's a certain distance that center of mass falls, and you can see that over here, that's three and a half feet, or he does it in meters, 1.0668 meters, so center of mass falls to the ground. He's saying that there is no initial falling position, that, that's fine. No initial falling velocity, V is velocity. And then he has one half acceleration times time squared. And that equation is correct. Acceleration here is the acceleration from gravity. So what he's saying is Mr. Sanderson's fall to the ground for the center of mass from three and a half feet, which is probably about right, hits the ground within, and he calculates the time, he solves for time. 0.466 seconds. So that's the first part of that, which is great. The problem comes in that he then says 
the velocity at contact is one half acceleration times time. And that is absolutely wrong. That is not the velocity at contact. The velocity at contact is just the acceleration times time. So he has this extra half. And it was unclear to me why that would be there to start, and I'm not sure why he put that in. But it creates problems for his calculations and his opinions moving forward. If we can go to the next page, I can explain that. So these are his equations. If you remember in his testimony, he said 4,000 Newtons. Yeah, that's a, an engineering unit in, in metric for force. 4,000 Newtons is roughly 950 pounds, I, I think, in English. But Newtons is fine. Over 4,000 Newtons, you get the rib fractures. So what is this equation here? Uh, I'll show you that and then explain why that one half makes a, a big difference. So that equation there comes from, at first, kinetic energy. We label that as Ke, which is equal to one half mass times velocity squared for that center of mass. And then he's saying, OK, Mr. Sanderson, as he hits the ground, has a certain kinetic energy. That energy has to go somewhere. So what happens is a force is applied from the ground to his center of mass, and he decelerates over some distance. So you can see here he has three inches written here. That, that's important. So this kinetic energy has to be taken up by some force over a distance. That's some amount of work. And that will equal the kinetic energy. And then he divides both sides to get the force. The distances cancel on this side. So the force on Mr. Sanderson is 1 half mass times velocity squared divided by distance. And that's exactly what we have here. We have 1 half mass, velocity squared, and distance. Now, remember, he's doing this in metric. So that 136, that is in kilograms. That's equal to about 300 pounds. So here, he has Miss Paltrow and Mr. Sanderson's mass put together. So in this fall, he's saying, OK, the kinetic energy of both of them is needed here during contact. But can we go back to page five? Um, he uses the velocity here, the 2.29, that has the 1 half in this. So if we go to the next page, yeah. So you can see he's using the wrong velocity. What happens is if you use the wrong velocity in here, let's do BAMES as, call this wrong. So what you get is 1 half mass times 1 half acceleration times time. Oops, squared. There we go. Divided by distance and squared there. Uh, correct is 1 half mass. acceleration times time squared. So that 1 half goes into this equation. What does that mean? That means that this half gets squared. It becomes 1 fourth. So the force that Dr. Bame calculated for this landing was actually 1 fourth of the force he should have calculated. He was off by a factor of 4. So it shouldn't be 4,680 newtons. It should be 18,600 and some newtons. Actually, I have it here. Um, 18,678 newtons. So he, he's off by quite a bit. And if I may, Dr. Scher, what, what this is obviously all uh, uh, at least new to me and maybe new to some jurors. What in the end uh, is, is the takeaway there, if there's that much of a mistake? So there's, there's two things. One is. If there were 18,000 newtons applied to Mr. Sanderson's chest, we would expect much worse injuries. The biomechanical engineering literature for much less than that has many more rib fractures, internal injuries, all sorts of things. We don't see any of that for Mr. Sanderson. 
But the real takeaway and, and the importance in this case is the mass here. So because he does the one quarter, he needs the mass he needs the mass to be 136 kilograms. Now, if you redo the calculations correctly, with, with just Mr. Sanderson's mass, so Mr. Sanderson is about 80 and a half kilograms, or roughly 177 pounds, at least according to the medical records. If you do the calculations with the correct equations, and only his mass, you get over 4,000 newtons when he lands. Actually, you get 11,056 newtons. So if he were to fall to the snow using Dr. Bame's calculation method the correct way, then just Mr. Sanderson falling, not Ms. Paltrow involved at all, he could get rib fractures. This is not quite correct overall. Normally, we use what's called effective mass. So all of Mr. Sanderson's mass wouldn't go through his chest. Maybe there'd be some force on his legs. If he hit his head, some force on his head. We typically would say maybe 50% of his mass would be appropriate for effective mass. So instead of the 80 kilograms, we would do, and actually, I should put over here, this winds up being 11,000 newtons. And if we do the 40 kilograms instead for Mr. Sanderson, so, um, and that's, uh, and we use the correct equation, we get 5,000, sorry, I don't do the math in my head, um, 5,000, 500 newtons, uh, approximately. What this means is Mr. Sanderson can fall to the ground without Ms. Paltrow landing on him and sustain the rib fractures according to Dr. Bain's calculation method. So if done correctly, he cannot say his opinion that Ms. Paltrow had to land on Mr. Sanderson to get the rib fractures, which means that this goes through the rest of his analysis. So the rest of his analysis is wrong. So this is really critical, that one half that, that he did for the velocity, the, the wrong velocity, really threw the rest of his analysis into question. So Dr. Schur, there's a lot more we could say about the calculations, I'm sure, and you would, you would approach it differently than he did, correct? That, that's correct. But given the way he did it, if he did it correctly, you're saying that the um, the, the conclusions that he came to are inconsistent with his opinion. That's correct. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay, so, um, yeah. Sure. Okay, doctor, let's talk about, um, let's talk about skier skier collisions. You've, as you explained earlier, done some research to understand what forces are like on the ski slope. Um, so, um, in this case, how, how would you apply what you know about physics to understand the, the claims about the ski collision? Uh, sure. I would apply Newton's laws to um, the contacts, the different versions of the events, and see um, what makes sense, how it would unfold. Do the physics of the contact that's being uh, testified to make sense? Is it self-consistent? And uh, this, this may be a, another opportunity to, to draw some pictures if you need to, so feel free to if it will help you. But um, you were talking about the center of mass earlier. How does that concept factor into how you would evaluate the evidence in this case? Uh, sure, yeah, if it's okay to draw again. You may. Thank you. And I can see what you're drawing through the monitor here. So. Oh, nice, perfect, oh, great. And if you need more uh, board or pages, we have them now, is that correct? Okay, yeah, great, go ahead. So um, the thing to know with Newton's laws, force equals mass times acceleration, if you have some, and I'm gonna draw two versions of a skier, and I'm 
not the best Pictionary player. Um, I'm gonna draw a top-down version and I'll draw a side version. So let's start with the top-down. So if we have a skier, and here's the skier's head, and here's the skier's nose, um, and then we have two skis. The center of mass would be, as we mentioned, looking down somewhere around here. Now, if you have a force that goes through the center of mass, so let's say the force goes through, then the person will accelerate in this direction. They'll accelerate along the line of the force. But what happens when you have a force that doesn't <coughs> go through the center of mass, it'll create an acceleration going in that same direction, but it'll also there's a distance here. It'll also create a torque, which is equal to the force times the distance, that will cause the person to rotate. And that's really important because if the force does not go through the center of mass, there's always a rotation. So if, if you're hit on the, this looking down, this would be the right side, then the person's going to rotate counterclockwise in this image. The same thing is true if we look at a skier from the side. So here we have our skier, and here's their pelvis, and center of mass. boot um, and if the person for example has a force applied below their center of mass then there's again some distance that's going to create a torque and a backward rotation so that the person moves backward and falls back um, there's two things to note with this for skiing in particular that's different than most other events. Skis have releasable bindings. So if I'm looking at this side view, the boot is held in by a heel piece and a toe piece. And so if you have someone pitching forward, if the ski slows and the person's center of mass moves forward, it'll create a torque on the boot and it'll release heel of the boot. And for someone of Miss Paltrow's size, that could be um, anywhere from, well, it's approximately 143 foot pounds. So 143 pounds acting over a foot. Um, same thing is true for the top down view. Uh, if we look at the toe piece for the binding, if there's a torque on, on the ski, a twisting torque, um, the ski will also release from the boot. And for someone of Miss Paltrow's size, it's about 37 foot pounds. So uh, in front of the boot, if there's 37 pounds, one foot ahead, it, it'll release. If it's two feet ahead, it's uh, half that value. So um, roughly 17. So these are the principles that we need to understand the mechanics of an impact in a fall. So when we apply those principles to this case, what conclusions do you draw? Sure. The first is that Miss Paltrow's version of events is consistent with the, the laws of physics and how people move and rotate. And uh, what about Mr. Ramon's version? For Mr. Ramon's version, I couldn't get it to work. Um, it, there's, it doesn't match with the laws of physics. The, the complete part of his testimony just doesn't fit. And so can you explain why it doesn't fit? Uh, sure. So uh, Mr. Ramon's version, oh, maybe I should sit down. Oh, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, in Mr. Ramon's version, he says that he sees Miss Paltrow contact um, Mr. Sanderson squarely in the back. And he says that um, it's in the middle. It couldn't be any more in the middle than if he tried or if she tried. And then also that she rode him down 
uh, I think the quote was something like um, in his deposition he says like uh, she wouldn't couldn't have been on his back any more than if he had strapped her to his back something like that so as they're going down in Mr. Ramon's version uh, Mr. Sanderson goes spread eagle um, arms out legs out uh, and the key for me is that Mr. Sander I'm sorry Mr. Ramon says that the inside edges of those skis that are going into this V catch and Mr. Sanderson stops on a dime. And if that were the case, then Miss Paltrow would keep moving and, well, maybe I should draw. Sure, some of go this. ahead if it will. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna try to draw a top-down version of this. So if we have Mr. Sanderson, and here are his skis. And then uh, I'm gonna use a different color for Miss Paltrow, how about blue? Miss Paltrow contacts him from the back. Um, and now, this is the same whether one ski is between his or, or both skis. Um, it, if the skis are apart, it's a little bit different, so we can get to that in a minute. But if, if her skis are between his, let's just say, then when he falls, and here is his, so they're moving in this direction. That was probably obvious, but I wanted to make sure that was clear. So. Now we're, we're still looking down. Here's Mr. Sanderson's back. Here's his head. Here's one arm. Here's another arm. Here's one leg, the other leg. Now, remember Mr. Ramon says that his skis are in a V, spread eagle. So now, if that were to happen, then he stops very quickly and Miss Paltrow is going to remain at, in contact somewhere around here, and her skis are going to stay underneath Mr. Sanderson. When that happens, it's like the center of mass continuing to move forward while the skis slow rapidly, which creates an upward force at that heel. It's going to create a heel release, but as you heard in the testimony, all the skis were on. It doesn't work. It takes actually very little force for this to release, the heel piece to release in a scenario like this. So it doesn't match with physics. And it's the same way whether one ski or both skis are in between. OK, so how do you know this, especially about the bindings releasing? How are you confident about that? Um, my, my experience, I mean, I've seen tons of binding releases. I know how bindings work. Um, it's uh, it's just physics, right? And you've specifically done research on binding releasing. Oh yes, yes. And and uh, you said earlier that there were other scenarios. The skis maybe between Mr. Sanderson's skis, maybe they're diagonal. Did you do evaluation of all those sort of scenarios? And did any of those work? No, I couldn't get any of them to work. So. Um, the, the key is either she would come out of the bindings or she would be stuck on Mr. Sanderson. Um, she wouldn't be able to move past him. If her skis stayed on in various versions of this, uh, I don't know how she continues to move downhill the 10 feet that Mr. Ramon said she wound up if her skis are trapped underneath him. And would you expect her to get an injury in any of these scenarios? Well, certainly um, there's that potential, yes, a lower extremity injury for sure. If, if, for example, her legs get stuck in one of the scenarios you mentioned. Right, so for example, if her ski is rotated out to the side going in that V with one of his skis, the other, whether it's on the outside or in the inside, can't wind up, um, well, so if her ski is on the outside, his ski is going to push her ski out. Um, if, if this is her ski, as he's, as he's falling and moving, 
into that V configuration, it's going to go from this position to here, and it's going to push her ski outward, um, which I would expect would create a toe release, um, a twisting release of the bindings, because it actually takes about 18 pounds of force between 15 and 20, depending on how her bindings would be set. So very little force to release that toe piece. But even if it didn't release, then her ski winds up getting trapped by his, and she can't move for, forward. So, um, and, and in many of these scenarios, her leg would get twisted in a really odd way that would likely create injuries. Okay, great. I think you can sit down again. And now what I'd like to do is ask you about uh, whether you were involved in creating any animations that would help the jury understand your opinions in this case. Yes. And, uh, Your Honor, if I may ask for permission to show the witness uh, these animations so that he, I can lay some foundation, he can use them to sure. teach the jury. Uh, we reserve our same objections on these animations, Your Honor. Understood. Recess while they straighten out the technology, and then we'll be back. You can step down. Whatever you need to do. Thank you.
everything working now? Yeah, sorry. The, we, we had plugged it in before, so I'm coming back to unplug it, so it's out of batteries. Okay. Dr. Sure is using the restroom. Okay. All right. Why don't you go ahead and have the jury come in? Dr. Sher, you can take the stand. We're just waiting for the jury. Are you a, a Yes. Yeah, she's monitoring uh, the oh, audio. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Egan. You may proceed. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. May I approach to show the witness the animation? You may. So this animation is number five, correct? It is. It's called Close Up. And I'm going to play it for you. Is this one of the animations that you helped prepare? Oh, sorry, Counselor. I didn't maybe see the uh... Sure. Which number is it? Number five. It's called Close Up. And it's 22 seconds. So again, Mr. Schur, uh, Dr. Schur, your, uh, uh, maybe explain to the jury your involvement in creating this animation. Uh, sure. I worked with uh, Brian Brill at Mountain Graphics on the uh, 
impact and fall portion of this animation. It's not meant to represent exactly what happened, but generally the idea of one of the uh, family of ways this could happen in Miss Paltrow's version. Um, we don't know some of the exact details of how they contacted, how long they interacted, but it gives an illustration of uh, what, it, what I'm thinking, my understanding of her version where they contact, she's contacted from behind, and then fall to the right. Um, and, the, yeah. and does the animation make certain assumptions about various facts um, and testimony in the record in this case? Yes, it does. Okay, and you can explain those to the jury as we go through it. Uh, sure, yeah. And the animation will help you explain what you've said earlier about biomechanics, applying biomechanics to this case. Right, exactly. Okay, so permission to publish this to the jury, Your Honor? Uh, just uh, we assert our ongoing objection to the animations or cartoons. They uh, lack foundation, uh, distort re the reality, and are incomplete. So animation number five is received for demonstrative purposes only to help this witness uh, explain his testimony. Thank you, Your Honor. So Dr. Schur, I'm going to let you take the reins here and use it as you need to explain, okay? Thank you. All right. Uh, can we... oh, Your Honor, we also object to the extent that this witness ha hasn't testified to any of in the placement of any of the other skiers or or bodies in this animation. Mr. Egan, uh, is that relevant to this witness's testimony? The other skiers? No, he's going to talk about the collision itself. So you should ignore any of the other skiers that are shown in the animation. Okay, so you can reverse it, Dr. Schur, to just uh, before the collision, so you can, we can focus on that and explain what you mean um, to show by this animation. Maybe I can't. How do you... <laughs> you could press play again, and it will get to it. Oh, here we go. Okay, there you go. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. So take us through, um, if you would, Dr. Schur, what uh, um, this animation shows from your point of view as a biomechanics expert. Sure. Um, the first thing that you should be aware of is that this is Miss Paltrow's version of the events. So Dr. Schur, sorry to interrupt you. Oh. Just maybe pull your mic. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, the, the first thing to be aware of is um, this is Miss Paltrow's uh, version of the events. So that's what we're showing here. And um, as we move forward, I'll talk about the physics, kind of like what I drew earlier with the center of mass and the rotation, and that's the idea, that's what went into this. But again, this is not exactly what happened, this is just one of the possible ways it could have happened. So um, we have Miss Paltrow in black, Mr. Sanderson in the blue, as uh, they move forward in time. Uh, it's uh, her testimony that his skis slid between hers. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, she felt a contact directly in the back, along her back. It sounded like her buttocks as well. Um, it, the person was grunting, um, pressing against her, but they were on their skis for a period of time. If in this situation he's also moving to skiers right, which is in the left in this image, that will create, remember I had the force that was offset from the center of mass. That's going to create a rightward motion for her, but also create some initial rotation. Now, in, in this portion, there's a number of possibilities. She could be adding weight to her right ski because of the contact from Mr. Sanderson. Um, when you ski, if you're in, let's just take a snowplow or what my kids call pizza position. If you weight the right ski, you turn left. So if she weights the, the right ski here more because of the contact, she's going to turn counterclockwise. The contact from Mr. Sanderson, if it's more to the right, will turn her counterclockwise. So as they're moving to the right here, there would be 
some counterclockwise rotation and here her ski can catch or she could pitch to the side or they could both pitch to the side they could both lose balance we're not sure what happens but as they're rotating they're continuing to fall and Miss Sanderson um, Miss Paltrow's version has them spooning uh, essentially as they're coming down together which would make sense if their legs got caught up if he was contacting her below her center of mass where his right leg was contacting her right leg her uh, thigh in that area also consistent with Miss Paltrow saying that her knee her right knee was splayed open at the end and she felt right knee discomfort that that all could happen there so as she's rotating and he's rotating counterclockwise they fall to the side now at this point here in the animation I guess maybe the next frame if I can do it Mr. Sanderson lands on his right side, maybe the right back. Um, it's hard, hard to say. If he lands on his right side, kind of like Dr. Bam said, you know, he needs to land on the elbow, that can happen. That can create lateral rib fractures. But that's not the only way. His arm could be out, he could land on the side and create lateral rib fractures. He could land on his side and a little bit towards the back and Miss Paltrow could land on him. She could be fully on him, maybe um, with her, her buttocks or her back or some portion of her mass compresses his chest front to back and that can create his rib fractures. There's a lot of different ways this could happen. I can't tell which one of those is right, but all of those are consistent with her version of the events. As they hit the snow, they would continue to move forward until friction slows them down and uh, it's also important to note, we haven't talked about the head injury, but hitting the back of the head or the side of the head, he could have his head turned. All of those are possibilities for him to contact his head on the snow. So that's not inconsistent as well. Would it be helpful to show it in real time? You've been doing it kind of slow motion, which sure. has been also been very helpful. Maybe, maybe start from the beginning and just play it. Objection lacks foundation for Trajectory, speed, and direction. Overruled, it's a demonstrative of this witness's testimony only. All right, thank you. Okay, and this and, is... Sorry, yeah, go ahead, Dr. This Shirk. is from the, the beginning. And if there's anything you want to comment on as it happens, feel free. I think that accurately reflects the version that Miss Paltrow testified to that matches the laws of physics and biomechanics as I understand them. And would it be helpful to show, there's one other animation that has a little zoom in from the other angle, would that also be helpful? I think, it, yeah, it can't okay. hurt. Let's show that then, permission to approach, Your Honor, for that. Okay. What's the number of this animation? This will be number it's called zoomed inside. Who was the last one, James? Five. Number five. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Wait just a sec. Okay, Dr. Sure. So I'm playing you number four, the zoomed in from the side version. Were you a part of creating this version as well? Yes, this is the same animation, but from a different camera view. Got it. And will this animation also help you explain the same things you've been going over it, with the jury? It's the same thing, sure. Yeah, I think it also visualizes, it, it illustrates my opinion. Okay. Your Honor, permission to show this uh, animation? Subject to the same objections by the plaintiffs, the animation for zoomed inside is received for demonstrative purposes only. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. So, Dr. Scherer, maybe since we've already gone through this, this slow motion, let's just play this one from the start, and then you can add anything that you can 
provide to the jury from this angle. Sure. Here, let's play first and then, there we go. Um, I'll wait until the contact point. So, it's coming up, here we go. There's contact, fall to the right. This one doesn't show the rotation quite as much, and we don't know the amount of counterclockwise rotation as well. There could be a little, there could be more or less. Right. We're not sure. But if you if you go backwards a little bit uh, in into the moment of the collision, this one maybe shows, uh, does this one show the skis coming between the skis? Yes, it does. And I think it's better visualized in this one. Yeah. and. And again, uh, what's the significance of that in terms of how the mechanism of the fall occurs? Well, um, that's Miss Paltrow's testimony, and it works for the physics of them falling and rotating slightly counterclockwise. Um, frankly, if it wasn't both skis, if it was one ski between hers, the kinematics would be the same. For example, if his right ski were on the outside of her right ski, it wouldn't change the general kinematics. This is generally, and I keep saying generally because we don't know the exact details of it, uh, this would work. So if we flipped the, the positions of the parties and Mr. Sanderson was in front, Ms. Paltrow came from behind, using this uh, as a good visual for the jury, we explain the, your opinions about what we, we would expect to happen um, on Mr. Ramon's account, I should say. Well, Mr. Ramon's account is very different because in Mr. Ramon's account, uh, Mr. Sanderson goes spread eagle and his skis go out into that V and the inside edges catch. And that changes the kinematics, the motion. Um, it's a very different version of what happens with the contact. And uh, in terms, uh, I, I guess we've covered that. So maybe we'll wrap up here. The um, You've covered a lot of things, a lot of new things perhaps for members of the jury and uh, those of us in the room. Will you, um, will you uh, summarize for us um, what, are, what are the main points that you want to get across for the jury here? Uh, sure, the first is that Dr. Baim cannot say with any accuracy that Miss Paltrow landed on Mr. Sanderson. His calculations are wrong and when you look at the equations done properly, Mr. Sanderson can land on the snow and sustain his injuries without Ms. Paltrow fall falling on him. And if I may, Dr. Schur, was it your understanding that Dr. Baim's opinion was that his account was the only possible way the injuries could occur? Yes, Mr. Ramon's version was the only possible way. He said Ms. Paltrow's was impossible, which I believe is false. I, I think Ms. Paltrow's version is possible. Right. And would you say that Ms. Pauchos is the more likely of the two accounts? Well, considering it's the only one that matches with the physics of what would happen in contact, yes, I think so. Okay, and I interrupted you. You were going through the, your main points. What was the next one? Well, I think we've covered it. The, the second thing is that Dr. Baim cannot say that Ms. Paltrow's version is impossible. That's absolutely wrong. It sounds like you're saying, in contrast to Dr. Baim, that there are various ways this... Uh, it, accident could have happened, the injuries could have uh, occurred for Mr. Sanderson, is that right? That's correct. And um, you've evaluated the various testimony, correct? I have. And you've, you've uh, done a careful analysis from a biomechanical engineer's perspective on what different scenarios might be likely or how they would happen, correct? Correct. And, and is it your opinion that Ms. Paltrow's version is the more likely of the two versions that you looked at, Mr. Ramones and Ms. Paltrow? Yes, once again, it's the only version out of the two that matches with the laws of physics, the, the biomechanics of it. Okay. Anything else you'd like to tell the jury that maybe I, I interrupted you on and you, you missed out on? No, I think we're, we're good. Okay, thank you. And that's thank all you. for now, Your Honor. Can you keep the screen there? Um, sure. You can turn it off. Well, actually, leave it on for right now. On or off? On. Okay. Uh, okay. Good morning, Mr. Or do you prefer Dr. Sure? 
Sure. That works. Sure, Doctor. Sure. Okay. Um, this version right here. Can you back it up about to here on the scroll? To here? Yeah, and then go forward it out halfway between the last one. Okay, a little farther. Just before when we when. Uh, Mr. Sanderson, who is also... Uh, Maybe it's easier if you do. Well, could you just go a little bit farther forward? Just go slow. I just want to get Mr. Sanderson, who sometimes called Dr. Sanderson. Mr. Deere, would you mind putting on the remote? That allows you to be picked up. Okay. How about to use this? Sure. Yeah. Does that work? Is this working? Oh, wait. Now it is. Okay. Uh, go a little farther forward, please. And then when we get, okay. Now, this is uh, Terry Sanderson. That's Mr. Sanderson, that's right. Okay. So his right eye is, uh, okay, go a little farther. Now just another thing, you know, fractions, a little bit farther. Okay. So, You have his head turned. That's based on uh, your testimony that uh, he is looking down the hill, I guess. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I believe his testimony is that he's looking at a woman who's a little downhill to the left. He notices her, looks at her. I don't remember what the exact words are. Okay, go a little farther. So his head, his his left eye would be looking directly at Miss Paltrow. He would see her, right? I believe so. He, and uh, it's inconsistent with his testimony. He didn't see her at all. That's correct. Because, but he would see her there, wouldn't he? I would think so. Okay, go a little farther. Just another fraction. In this picture, you don't, you don't have Dr. Or, uh, Ter or excuse me, Craig Ramon in there. Who, um, how far above would this point be? Where I just pointed. How many yards would that be above this image right here? I, I don't know without doing a measurement, but I'm concentrating on <coughs> the collision between Mr. Sanderson and Miss Paltrow. Well, Craig Ramon testifies he was about 30 to 40 feet above. And so these objects are about five, you know, bent over, maybe five feet high. So if we just flop over, you know, um, six bodies, we'd get to 30 feet. That would be about right here. Wouldn't it? I'm not sure. Well, you're an engineer, highly trained PhD. You can't even guesstimate that uh, that would be about 30 feet. I, I can't tell. Would uh, up here be 30 feet? Don't you think it would be a lot more than 30 feet? Probably, but I don't know. Well, you helped create this uh, animation. Uh, you don't know the distances in your own animation? No, no, I have concentrated on the collision portion. That's the biomechanics portion. Okay, who, who did the, uh, es the estimates or guesstimates of the distances of the bodies of the other people. So that's going to be uh, Mr. Boggard, who's going to be on soon, I assume. OK, so uh, this animation doesn't have Craig Ramon in, in the scene at all? Not at this point. OK. It, is it because the defense doesn't want him in the scene so to discredit his witness account? Oh, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, you'll have to ask Mr. Boggart. Okay, we will. Okay, let's see. Uh, just go another little section. You just tell me when. I'll yeah. keep 
going until yeah, you say stop. Yeah, just go slow. I just want to go slow motion. Okay. Now stop right there. Now, do you know the time, how much time from the initial, let's say, impact of their bodies to this point would be? You did this calculation. This is your, your bailiwick, your, what you're talking about. Do you mean in the animation or do you mean in real right life? Right now. It, yeah, yeah. From the impact at this point, approximately like a fourth of a second, a half a second, a tenth of a second. Do you? Miss Paltrow says that they're in contact for a little while, a few seconds before they fall over. So um, I, I don't know what it is in particular in this animation. If that's what you're asking. So. Uh, you, you helped design this part of the animation, so you don't know how far it is. You just guessed it. Uh, again, we don't know exact timing and distance. This represents an illustration of the version. So, um, it, yeah, it is what it is. It, it's an, illustrative, an illustration of the version, but there could be wide variability in that version, right? Uh, there is variability, but we have constraints on it. Uh, the constraints are, you know, could have happened the opposite way, right? The opposite way. No, uh, Miss Paltrow hit Terry Sanderson. No, I don't think so. Not with the testimony that's given. We have two versions. We have Mr. Ramon's version, and we have Miss Pal Miss Paltrow's version. This is Miss Paltrow's version. Mr. Ramon's version is very different. Okay, well, let's talk about that for a second. Um, Being paid, uh, excuse me. You're being paid. Uh, what is it? Four twenty-five an hour for this? No. Um, is it more than four twenty-five an hour? It is. Um, four fifty an hour? Nope. Five hundred? It's five hundred an hour. Five hundred an hour. And uh, you build something over ten thousand dollars so far for your work? That sounds about right. More than fifteen thousand? No, I don't think so. So between ten and fifteen thousand. Okay. Um, you can turn that off for right now. Is it? I'll just take it. I think that's probably better. No, please leave it there. Oh. I may come back to it. What's the best way to do I just disconnect it? Is that? Yeah, maybe just disconnect it. Like that? Okay. No, you're here to teach the uh, the jury, right? The defendant's version, correct? Uh, teach the jury the physics that would be helpful in understanding how to assess the accident. So that's a, a no. You're not teaching the defendant's version. Uh, I'm not teaching any version. I'm teaching the uh, physics and mechanical engineering, biomechanical engineering, that would help the jury. I know it's hard for expert witnesses to say yes or no, but are you teaching the the defendant's version. I guess I don't understand the question. Okay. <coughs> Seemed like a simple question. Next, I'd like to uh, talk about. Uh, did you review Dr. Gibby's testimony at trial? Uh, no, but I did see some of his trial testimony. All of it or some of it? Some of it. Uh, was it more than 10 minutes? Mm, probably, yeah. More than 20 minutes? Yep. Yeah. More than an hour? I don't think more than an hour. Okay. Uh, you didn't disclose anything about see, uh, hearing Dr. Gibby's testimony? Um, I'm not sure what you mean, but um, I did see it. Okay. Um, uh, you've never disclosed to the plaintiff your reports or your testimony ahead of this trial, correct? Your Honor, I um, may we approach? Yes.
Are you an expert on broken ribs? Um, I am comfortable talking about the biomechanics related to rib fractures. Have you done any papers or studies or research on ribs and fr rib fractures? Me personally, no, but I've read the biomechanical and engineering literature relevant to them. Okay. Um, uh, you haven't mentioned that biomechanical literature in specifics, correct? I'm not sure about in specifics, but I think we mentioned it on direct. Okay. Um. So you, you said that uh, Dr. Sanderson, or I'm just going to call him Terry. Terry was 70 years old at the time of this crash? He was 69, but effectively 70 for biomechanics purposes. Effectively because 70 is older? No, because um, there's actually good information in the biomechanical engineering literature about the amount of chest compression required to create rib fractures for 70-year-olds. Um, and not 69-year-olds? Well, it's actually the full distribution, but the paper that I'm thinking of from Agnew specifically talks about 70-year-olds. You didn't mention that paper today. No, but you, would you like it? Uh, not right now, thanks. I've not seen it. Um, let's see. Well, I'm going to go right to the another point. You have this theory of rotation, correct? That your ver the version you're calling. Uh, Ms. Paltrow's version is a kind of a rotation version? Um, there is some rotation. It may be a little. It might be more than a little. We don't know. Okay, so we don't know how much rotation there is, correct? Sure. Okay. I'd like to... Let me see if this thing works. It did work last time. Already done it. Okay. Or someone on your team has. Okay, good. You may I borrow a pen. Yeah. Your Honor, we would object to him writing on the witness's board. It's not an exhibit. He's, it's certainly fair game. Okay. So, well, let Doctor, can we mark it as an exhibit, Your Honor? Why don't you take a picture of it, and you can use that, and then he can ahead, add, he can add to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is our board. Right, and in academic we, fields, we don't we don't have any questions pre uh, right now. So, in academic fields, it's common that uh, for the jury here. Uh, sure. The first is that Dr. Bame cannot say with any accuracy that Miss Paltrow landed on Mr. Sanderson. His calculations are wrong, and when you look at the equations done properly, Mr. Sanderson can land on the snow and sustain his injuries without Miss Paltrow fall falling on him. And if I may, Dr. Schur, was it your understanding that Dr. Bame's opinion was that his account was the only possible way the injuries could occur. Yes, Mr. Ramon's version was the only possible way. He said Ms. Paltrow's was impossible, which I believe is false. I, I think Ms. Paltrow's version is possible. Right, and would you say that Ms. Paltrow's is the more likely of the two accounts? Well, considering it's the only one that matches with the physics of what would happen in contact, yes, I, I think so. Okay, and I interrupted you. You were going through the, your main points. What was the next one? Oh, I think we've covered it. The, the second thing is that Dr. Bame cannot say that Miss Paltrow's version is impossible. That's absolutely wrong. 
it sounds like you're saying, in contrast to Dr. Bain, that there are various ways this uh, accident could have happened, the injuries could have uh, occurred for Mr. Sanderson, is that right? That's correct. And um, you've evaluated the various testimony, correct? I have. And you've, you've uh, done a careful analysis from a biomechanical engineer's perspective on what different scenarios might be likely or how they would happen, correct? Correct. And and is it your opinion that Ms. Paltrow's version is the more likely of the two versions that you looked at, Mr. Ramones and Ms. Paltrow? Yes, once again, it's the only version out of the two that matches with the laws of physics, the, the biomechanics of it. Okay. Anything else you'd like to tell the jury that maybe I, I interrupted you on and you, you missed out on? No, I think we're, we're good. Okay, thank you. And that's thank all you. for now, Your Honor. Do you keep the screen there? Uh, sure. You can turn it off. Well, actually, leave it on for right now. On or off? On. on. Okay. okay. Mr. Egan, Mr. Dealer. Good morning, Mr. Or do you prefer Dr. Sure? Sure, that works. Sure, Dr. Sure. Okay. Um, this version right here. Can you back it up about to here on the scroll? To here? Yeah, and then go forward it out halfway between the last one. Okay, a little farther. Just before when we, when uh, Mr. Sanderson, who was also. Uh, Maybe it's easier if you do. Well, could you just go a little bit farther forward? Just go slow. I just want to get Mr. Sanderson, who sometimes called Dr. Sanderson. Mr. Deere, would you mind putting on the remote? That allows you to be picked up. Okay, how about, can I use this? Sure. Yeah. Now it is. Okay, uh, go a little farther forward, please. Okay, and then when we get, okay. Now, this is uh, Terry Sanderson. That's Mr. Sanderson, that's right. Okay. So his right eye is, uh, okay, go a little farther. So you have a, you have his head turned. That's based on uh, your testimony that uh, he is looking down the hill. I guess is that what you're saying? Uh, I believe his testimony is that he's looking at a woman who's a little downhill to the left. He notices her, looks at her. I don't remember what the exact words are. Okay, go a little farther. So his head, his his left eye would be looking directly at Miss Paltrow. He would see her, right? I believe so. He, and uh, it's inconsistent with his testimony. He didn't see her at all. That's correct. Because, but he would see her there, wouldn't he? I would think so. Okay, go a little farther. Just another fraction. Picture you don't, you don't have Doctor or, uh, Ter or excuse me Craig Ramon in there. Who, um, how far above would this point be? Where I just pointed. How many yards would that be above this image right here? I, I don't know without doing a measurement, but I'm concentrating on <laughs> the collision between Mr. Sanderson and Miss Paltrow. Well, Craig Ramon testifies he was about 30 to 40 feet above. And so these objects are about five, you know, bent over, maybe five feet high. So if we just flop over, you know, um, six bodies, we'd get to 30 feet. That would be about right here. I'm not sure. 
well, you're an engineer, highly trained PhD. You can't even guesstimate that uh, that would be about 30 feet? I, I, I can't tell. Would uh, up here be 30 feet? Don't you think it would be a lot more than 30 feet? Probably, but I don't know. Well, you help create this uh, animation. Uh, you don't know the distances in your own animation? You know, I've concentrated on the collision portion. That's the biomechanics portion. Okay, who, who did the, um, es the estimates or guesstimates of the distances of the bodies of the other people? So that's going to be uh, Mr. Boggard, who's going to be on soon, I assume. Okay, so uh, this animation doesn't have Craig Ramon in, in the scene at all? Not at this point. Okay. Is it because the defense doesn't want him in the scene so to discredit his witness account? Oh, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, you'll have to ask Mr. Boggart. Okay. We will. Okay, let's see. Uh, just go another little section. Going into yeah, just stuff. go slow. I just want to go slow motion. Okay. Now stop right there. Now, do you know the time, how much time from the initial, let's say, impact of their bodies to this point would be? You did this calculation. This is your, your bailiwick, your, what you're talking about. Do you mean in the animation or do you mean in real right life? Right now. It, yeah, I mean, yeah. From the impact at this point, approximately like a fourth of a second, a half a second, a tenth of a second. Do you? Miss Paltrow says that they're in contact for a little while, a few seconds before they fall over. So um, I, I don't know what it is in particular in this animation. If that's what you're asking. So uh, you, you helped design this part of the animation, so you don't know how far it is. You just guessed it. Uh, again, we don't know exact timing and distance. This represents an illustration of the version. So um, it, yeah, it is what it is. It, it's an, illustrate of, an illustration of the version, but there could be wide variability in that version, right? Uh, there is variability, but we have constraints on it. I mean, the constraints are, it could have happened the opposite way, right? The opposite way. No, uh, Miss Paltrow hit Terry Sanderson. No, I don't think so. Not with the testimony that's given. We have two versions. We have Mr. Ramon's version, and we have Miss Pal Ms. Paltrow's version. This is Miss Paltrow's version. Mr. Ramon's version is very different. Okay, uh, let's talk about that for a second. Um, being paid, uh, excuse me, you're being paid, uh... All right, we were listening in there to the Gwyneth Paltrow ski collision trial there. We have a separate uh, stream on our uh, YouTube page there at uh, YouTube dot com slash live now fox so we'd love to have you on there as uh you you could see gavel to gavel coverage right there of course on live now from fox all right everyone we are going to take our final break here of this hour take a look at uh the dow right now relatively flat there just up about 26 points in the green we will take a quick two minute break and listen into a little bit more of the senate hearing featuring uh the latest on banking concerns in america
for the record, Your Honor, I'd like to move to strike all of his testimony because it, this wasn't disclosed improperly. I, I anticipate the ruling, but I just want to, for the record, make the ruling. It's overruled. It was disclosed properly, counsel. Okay. What I'd like to do is uh, understand that you've made a lot of assumptions, and the jury would like to know how reliable your opinions are. So how can that be reliable when you totally discount some major events like what the direction of Miss Paltrow's body was compared to her skis? And uh, there is testimony about Miss Paltrow's uh, body movement. Um, do you know that? I guess prior I don't understand. To the crash, your... Just prior to the crash? What version are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Sorry. Uh, do you know the, about the version of Carrie Oaks? Um, I don't think she saw the accident. Have you read her deposition? I have. Okay. Uh, you realize she testified that one of the kids said, Mommy, watch us ski. Um, and the kids were up there on the left. Miss Paltrow was down on the right, which would tend to show that Ms. Paltrow was looking up to her left at the point of collision? I don't recall that. Okay. So you're, you're excluding Carrie Oaks' testimony, correct? That's wrong. You're including her testimony? I considered it, sure. And you, are there any assumptions you've made based on her testimony? Not in particular that I can think of, but there may be. So could you speak up? Not in particular that I can think of. Okay. Not particularly that you can think of about Carrie Oaks's testimony, okay? Are you an expert on head injuries? Um, I'm comfortable talking about head injuries from the biomechanics standpoint. Have you ever studied uh, or held yourself out as an expert on concussion? Uh, if it's diagnosing or treating concussion, no. If it's the biomechanics related to the formation of concussion, yes, I've done helmet research and head injury research, in particular for snow sports. Did you apply any of your knowledge about concussion to this case? I certainly looked at it, but Dr. Baim was very particular in his testimony that it was only the rib fractures that allowed him to say that Ms. Paltrow contacted Mr. Sanderson from behind. So that's what I concentrated on for the jury. And you ignored his discussion about the head injury? Oh, no, I certainly considered it. And it's not relevant in this case? Well, in disproving Dr. Baim, it's not relevant, but I'm happy to talk about it. Okay. Well, it's not clear you disproved Dr. Baim when you don't even know the direction of Ms. Paltrow's skis at the, at the beginning of this. It's also, I think, a, a big assumption to say what the body position of Ms. Paltrow was when she hit Terry Sanderson in the back. Sustained, and I don't. Was there a question in there, counsel? Um, just if that was accurate, I'll withdraw it. studied rib injuries, uh, have you ever testified about rib injuries before? Could you clarify what the question is? Have you ever studied rib injuries um, and t t testified about them in the past? That sounds like two questions. Have you ever testified about rib injuries in the past? I, I don't recall, but it's okay. likely. Most likely you have? I, I think so. How many they're, they're have common. you testified more than 100 times? In trial, probably 35 times, something in that ballpark. In total, under oath, have you testified more than 100 times? Including depositions, yes. More than, uh, less than 200 times? I would agree with that. Okay.
check. That's all I have for now. Thank you, Dr. Scher. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bueller. Mr. Egan. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Scher, we'll, we'll just be real quick here. Did anything Mr. Bueller asked you change your opinion that Ms. Paltrow's account is consistent with the laws of physics to your understanding and Mr. Ramon's is not? That remains the same. Thanks. Mr. Bueller? Just, um, I think you said this before, that you're an expert in the laws of physics, but you're not an expert in medical uh, medicine or, or um, orthopedics or neurology, correct? I am a biomechanical engineer. I am not a medical doctor. I do not diagnose and treat, but I do look at what forces and what motions create damage to the body. Thank you. That's all. You may step down. Thank you. Thank you. May I call your next witness? Paul Bogger, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, before, before Mr. Bogger comes up to testify, we may want to take a five or ten minute break. I want to address something with the court outside the presence of the jury. We'll have to take one shortly anyway, so let's go ahead and do it now. Ms. Van Orman. Your Honor, pursuant to our motion in limine, Mr. Bogger's testimony is going to be significantly limited in this case. Um, the problem that I am foreseeing is that, um, I and I could be wrong, but it appears to me that counsel is going to try and use Mr. Bogger to then um, describe some further animations and place individuals on that animation. And I have significant concerns with that for a number of reasons. Number one, Mr. Bogger's not um, qualified to do that. He didn't take any kind of measurements, calculations, determinations of speed, force, physics, et cetera, in this case. But in addition, in his report, he does not make any mention of where people were, where they were placed. This would. It, any kind of discussion of him talking about the animation and if he was responsible for putting the people somehow on that um, animation. He does not describe that in his report. He doesn't talk that in his report regarding um, participating in an animation. He provides no diagrams in his report, no discussions of where people were or weren't. So I don't think that it would be appropriate for him to even deal with the animation or that his testimony that he's the one that was responsible for putting, say, Apple here and Moses here and that type of thing. That would go significantly beyond anything he did in his report. So that's my concern, and I wanted to address that now rather than a sidebar. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Egan? Yes, Your Honor. So uh, I think our response would be that um, Mr. Bogger has poured over the records in this case, and he has, um, in producing these animations, made certain assumptions about which, uh, what testimony um, might be consistent with the illustration that the animations provide. He can be very clear with the jury that he's uh, assuming certain facts. He's not finding these facts. He's assuming that they're true. They come from the record. He can explain that they're, they're rough illustrations. He's not made measurements and decided that, yes, it's, this is exactly 30 feet. He, he can be subject to cross-examination on, um, on any point that might be inconsistent with testimony. He can explain that he chose to assume these facts and not other facts, and that if you assumed other facts, you might get different illustration. Um, 
and then uh, he, you know, he will explain that the, the assumption of various facts that are shown in the um, animations are consistent with his understanding of ski collisions and ski, sp ski, skiing generally, which he has decades of experience, not just with skiing himself, but with uh, investigating accidents, collisions, uh, hundreds and hundreds of them for um, various purposes, m mostly not litigation, mostly to figure out risk management concerns, deciding whether certain skiers have to be banned from a, a certain resort or a ski area. Um, he's, uh, he has a, uh, ample experience to be able to discuss how to um, consider various factors in, in um, uh, evaluating a ski collision like this that has complex um, uh, testimony that's not all consistent and the jury in our in our view uh, needs to hear from a ski expert that knows how to do that and can explain to them the principles that he uses he will not tell the jury this is likely what happened or that uh, I have found that this has this must be the case he'll say I've assumed these facts he can be very clear about what he's assumed and then use that animation to explain to the jury how to think through the case given his ample experience with evaluating ski collisions. So Mr. Egan, I guess I'm still not hearing an expert opinion from Mr. Bogger, is it, mm -hmm. that, uh, that would have helped the jury? I mean, it, you're, everything that I'm hearing has him weighing evidence, has him making decisions about what may have happened on that day. And that's invading the providence of the jury. It's not really going to help them. Your Honor, I see it as uh, like, say, a medical malpractice case, which I'm more familiar with. If a certain set of facts might be in the record about what happened in a surgery, for example, then a surgeon, expert surgeon who has lots of experience reviewing and, uh, records about also doing the surgery himself, knowing what the training is, um, uh, looks at the records, looks at the various claims, and, and you, as you said in uh, your um, order ruling, I believe, yesterday, can say, I, if we assume these facts, given my expertise, I can say this makes sense, or this is consistent with my understanding of surgery. Um, and so my, um, my proposal is that we use Mr. Bogger in that sort of way, where he can help the jury understand, given w what he knows about skiing and given what he, he's seen in the record, that there are certain um, principles you can use if you assume certain facts to, um, uh, to evaluate uh, a certain collision such that you, uh, you, you're applying some rational principles rather than just generally um, uh, going with a certain gestalt feeling about s what someone said. You're actually trying to rationally go through how to evaluate a ski collision, which again, he has decades and decades of experience doing. And he won't say, uh, he'll say to the jury, you're um, uh, the ones that have to decide what happened. This is a very difficult case to decide. Is it your, it, your medical malpractice expert example, isn't that? an expert that's coming in to evaluate whether the standard of care was breached? Yeah, well, so, uh, yes, usually we would, we would offer an expert in that way, but given your ruling, I'm, I'm just trying to use that as an analogy where we could still use expertise that would help the jury without rendering that, that final opinion, telling them, you know, as an expert, uh, you know, you should, you should do this, and I'm really the one that knows because I have tons of experience. Instead, he can say, here's, here's how I evaluate these accidents, and let me show you how to do it. And then they have, they have rational principles that come from his field of you know, uh, skiing and ski accident evaluation that, that help them, that they have not heard. They haven't heard from any ski expert that has provided to them that kind of a rational um, layout for analyzing the various complex um, claims in this case, and I think that would help them. Sure, and, and I think I, in my, I guess, preliminary ruling on this witness the other day, yesterday, um, I'm losing track of the days here. Yeah, me too. Um, I think I stated that he is qualified, certainly has qualifications, and can testify as to what a reasonable skier would do or not do 
in a certain hypothetical set of facts. But in terms of applying and weighing the evidence in this case, I think that goes too far. Okay, so, but, but if, if we showed the animation and we made it clear to the jury that we're assuming certain facts, we're not, we're not weighing them, we're just saying, look, let's, let's take these facts, we're assuming them, we're not saying that they're proven, we're just showing you how to analyze the facts, assuming these, uh, these various parts of the testimony are true, that would be too far, you're saying? That sounds like closing argument. It okay. doesn't sound like a, what a witness can offer under Rule 702. He can talk about, I mean, he's, he's an expert in skiing. He can talk about skiing dynamics. He can explain what a snowplow is, what parallel skiing is, um, what, uh, what the rules of, of skiing are generally understood to be. But in terms of taking that next leap, I don't, I don't think he can, he can say, I've looked at the deposition testimony and I can tell you who's at fault here, or I can tell you who did something wrong here. Um, I just don't see, I think that's the jury's responsibility. And I don't want a witness telling the jury how to make its decisions or how to think, how to, how to make a decision that's uh, either an ultimate issue or one of the issues leading up to that ultimate issue. So even him explaining his process for how to evaluate ski collisions would be too far? To what end? Why does the jury need to know how he evaluates a ski collision? Because evaluating ski collisions is a complex matter and he has expertise as to how to do that. Yeah, you know, right now I'm just talking in a, uh, or I'm, I'm responding to your question sort of in a vacuum. I don't know what it is he's offering. Um, if it would help, I could give you kind of an example. Like, sure. if I could say, you, Mr. Bogger, when you evaluate ski collisions and you've evaluated, you know, have established that he's evaluated hundreds of, and hundreds of ski collisions, um, have you ever evaluated collisions where there's conflicting testimony? Yes. When you approach that testimony, what are principles you use to evaluate that? And he can explain those principles. He doesn't have to talk about the facts of this case. He can explain here are these principles. I don't think the jury's heard that. I think it would be helpful to them. I think it would be rational and not over, it wouldn't be so overbearing. Ask, asking him how he evaluates credibility. Uh, I guess that's true. How does he reconcile different accounts? Right, but we wouldn't, if, I mean, if given your ruling, we, we wouldn't go into applying it to this case. We would just give them the rational principles that would help them uh, weigh the evidence. It wouldn't tell them how to do it. It would just give them a framework for doing it, which only he can provide. Uh, they have not heard from somebody that has that does this for a living, has done it again. And not how does just that vary from what the jury does? If you look at the credibility jury instruction that I've already read, mm -hmm. for example, and how does that differ? I mean, where, there, where it talks about conflicting testimony, how does it, how does what he's offering provide any specialized knowledge? I, I consider that generalized. Yeah. Knowledge. So I don't think he would just talk about you know um, general principles of evaluating witnesses. He would talk about particular aspects of a ski ski slope like, or witnesses like on a. Um, if he were here right now, he could help me. Um, um, yeah, right. He is right here. So when, when ski uh, accidents happen uh, um, and people go to the ground, their their skis get released. I could see that as specialized yeah. knowledge, just right. like this witness yeah. offered something along those lines. Yeah. No, that is, an, that, that is an important thing. He can explain But in terms that. of this skier said such and such and this skier said such and such, but this is, what I, this is how I evaluate that aspect of it, I think that's invading the providence of the jury. Okay. On deciding how to weigh testimony. Okay. I mean, for the record, if, if I may, Your Honor, uh, we'll, we'll just, we'll, we'll, I think we put this on before, but in case we didn't, we, we believe the motion uh, to exclude Dr. Bogger or limit his testimony is untimely, and that um, Greg Scordis, their expert, who, whose report does much the same thing that Mr. Bogger's report does, should be limited in the same way. Um, and uh, again, just renew our request that he be able to speak to the jury about his evaluation of the ski accident. So just again, my, my sort of ultimate conclusion on what I'm hearing from on this uh, motion to reconsider and on the response from the defense, 
is that it's up to the jury to decide ultimately what the parties did, where the parties were positioned, and who ran into whom. So it's up for the jury to make those decisions. So as long as this witness steers clear of those areas, that's the main emphasis of my of my preliminary ruling, and I'll have to hear what is what's being offered. Okay. But, do you mind? Uh, I know I'm not an old man, but my memory has failed me. Those three again, who hit whom going backwards? It's up to the jury to decide ultimately what the parties did. Right. In other words, leading up to, during, and after the accident. It's up for the jury to decide that. Um, where the and, and various experts have given them some helpful information, like the, uh, the, the biomedical expert uh, gave testimony as to what the biomedical evidence reflected that would help the jury make that decision. Just like this past witness gave the jury some uh, uh, biomechanical information that will help the jury make their decision about what happened in that accident, what the parties did, where the parties were positioned, and who ran into whom. And, and the reason that you see Mr. Bogger as doing something different than, like, say, Dr. Schur just did, who took the jury through assuming these various facts. I'm not telling you that this account is true, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, and I'm just taking there the, the, as an assumption what Ms. Paltrow said was true. Let's analyze it. You're seeing Mr. Bogger as different, and, and I'm not totally sure how. Do you mind well, explaining the that? plaintiff's witness um, applied biomedical principles in a methodical way to the different versions and then handed the jury that information. The biomechanical expert that just testified uh, applied biomechanical principles to the different versions and gave that information to the jury to help them make a decision. Okay. So and, and what I what I see this witness doing is reading different accounts and reconciling them and wanting to give the, his his reconciliation to the jury which I think is too close to what the jury actually does. It doesn't provide any, it doesn't help the jury from an expert standpoint. Okay, so it sounds like you're not persuaded that, that you know, of our position, which is that he has skiing expertise similar to like a biomechanical engineer has and can, and can apply that to the facts in a Correct. way that would pro provide the jury with some, again, rational, um, scheme to assess the the uh, accident that they the wouldn't have otherwise under rule 702 right. okay. and and the same would like is likely going to hold true to mr. Scordis's testimony okay and you say likely I haven't so I mean I've heard, heard I've heard you make kind of a motion I haven't heard from the other side whether they're opposing that in some way I see. you're just waiting till you have but more except, specifics. I mean, if he's the same type of an expert and I I realize that he may, he may not be a risk manager and he may not be a, a ski accident investigator for, for a, an employer, but it sounds like his testimony is along the same lines. Right, okay. So um, just in terms of guidance on this ruling, um, you, you, you mentioned the bindings, and I apologize if we're going long. I just want to make sure that we... Um, Specialized knowledge right. so that can help the jury in making their decision. So would, in your mind, would something like recognizing that uh, the positioning of the skiers, if one skier is uphill, uh, applying a, a certain knowledge of skiing, um, uh, that, that would suggest certain things about the accident, would that be out of bounds? I, I guess I have to hear the question, but it, uh, it sounds like you're getting back into the, you know, making conclusions based on an investigation. If you say, if you, uh, if you lay out some hypothetical facts to say if this skier was here and this skier was here, um, from a skiing standpoint, you know, and then ask questions based on that, I could see that, but okay. um, I, it, it's feeling a little too hypothetical right now. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thanks for your patience with my, okay. my questions. Sure. Ms. Van Orman. this in the first place is the concern with the animation and so what I don't want because Mr. Bogger apparently had some involvement in 
in creating the animation, which was not designated in his report, nor was any mention on what his involvement was, what he did for it, how he placed anybody any, anywhere. There's no discussion of any of that. I don't think that it's appropriate for him to comment on the animation and to say, well, yes, I, I saw that. You know, This helps me because I'm the one who helped to place these people there. It would have been, again, by reading the depositions and applying, which is what the jury needs to do. So I would say he can't even talk about the animations because that just goes beyond the scope of his report, anything that he's done in the case. I would agree. Unless the foundation can be set. I, mean, we, I haven't heard anything that would establish a foundation. I we have no, been no broadsided, problem. Your Honor. We had a 37-page report produced a long, long time ago. There was a motion deadline that we pr uh, respected months ago. The, th these issues were ordered, were argued 45 days ago. And then immediately before our witness is going to take the stand with this 37-page report, we get essentially a midnight filing and that guts half of his opinions. I, I don't think it's fair, Your Honor. I can't even read the darn thing. I'm focused on getting my witnesses ready. Uh, the untimeliness is very prejudicial to us, Your Honor, because we can't properly brief this in days. Okay, I've, I've already ruled that the that the initial motion was timely, it, and and I made a ruling on the initial motion. The subsequent motion was not untimely. The court has agreed to reconsider the motion, and that's what I've done. And I, I don't feel that it's unfair or unduly prejudicial. You were aware of the issues with his report uh, long ago. But, but you ruled in our favor before. What I ruled was that the, that the initial motion didn't give the court enough to grant it. Because they and so then there was a motion briefed it. Then there was a motion to reconsider that gave the court more information. And I can see that it would be, I mean. You can't poorly brief you don't want a to, motion. I mean, this would create an appealable issue. Do you want to do that for your client is my question. No, but I don't, I don't want to. They poorly brief something, the judge denies it. Then right before the testimony, they better brief it, and now we lose. I mean. That's what trial is. This is trial. Things happen. Um, the, the points that were raised in the motion are valid points. They're sound. They're based soundly in the law, and I, and I want to make sure that what the jury hears is sound and, and not subject to any more risk of appeal than possible. So we'll take five before the jury comes back. <laughs>